the last couple of weeks we've talked about uh, ego. And I've said right out, uh, we're going to talk about ego, which of course is the way we look at ourselves. The Buddha talked about it all the time. He never called it that, but he was talking about that self-perception. And in the practice of Zen, this is really the beginning and the ending of the practice because we tie up our, all our bad habits and all our preconceptions and all our processing problems with the self. And so we say that a person that becomes awakened <clears throat> sees the world as it is. And all they really see is themselves. But in seeing themselves as they truly are, they're able to see everyone else as they truly are. And they're able to see the world as it is. So the Buddha <clears throat> gets this interesting description given about himself, that he's all-knowing. And yet he never claimed to know what was under that rock outside. Uh, he was all-knowing because he, know, he knew his true nature, and he knew who he was. And he knew the nature of life. And because he knew that, he knew everyone else. Um, all the secrets are buried within us. The secrets of why people are bad and the secret of why people are good. And all the capacities are buried within us. We have the capacity to be a saint, and we have the capacity to be the sinner. Uh, we carry everything around. So that sometimes a teacher will say when someone can't understand an atrocity, how could anyone ever do this thing? How could every, anyone ever be that evil? Sometimes the teacher will say, well, just look within yourself, and you will find the roots of this evil. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that all people are going to act upon these impulses or these potentials. It simply means they have them. To be a human being is to be as all human beings. <clears throat> For many years I practiced meditation without consciously practicing reflection. And to my way of thinking, the Buddha does not directly talk about <clears throat> this idea of reflection. But I think somewhere along the line, the old Zen masters became aware of it. Because in uh, their leading their students, they began asking them probing questions that they had to answer. And after a few hundred years, these probing questions, which were really very individualized in the beginning, there was no formula, there was no book, and there was no set uh, of answers that were correct. They would ask students questions like, who are you? And they would say, where did you come from? And they would say, is the flag moving or is the wind moving? They would ask these kinds of questions. And these questions were reflection questions. Because if I said to you right now, I'll give you some homework when you come back next Sunday, tell me, which is moving, the wind or the flag? And then you could come back in and we could have a free-for-all in here, as I said to you. Okay, give me the answer. Well, the important point here is not whether the wind's moving or the flag's moving. The important point is, what do you think? What, not what is the ultimate reality, but what do you think? Because we all know that if we had 100 people in a room and we ask a question, uh, any simple question, we would get more than one answer. Sometimes we'll get 100 answers. Where do those 100 answers come from? And to make it even more difficult, those 100 answers all may be correct. And how could that possibly be? Because of perception. Because we all see things differently. Right now, we're all in a different place in this room. So ask to describe this room without turning your head. You will describe a different room. If we all ate a nice dessert that Jackie made, pressed to describe the dessert and what we thought of it, we would have completely different answers. If we got past the, oh, it's really good. Yeah, if we got past that and asked for some descriptions of what was going on, because even our tongues are all different. The young have very sensitive tongues, and the old have to eat hot foods because their tongue's worn out, and they want to experience some sensation. 
So the idea that everybody is equipped with the same sensors is a little silly. Even at birth, we see things differently. So the old teacher says, what is moving, the flag or the wind? And you have to contend with this, knowing that nobody can see the flag as you can see it. But in the beginning, you may not realize that. In the beginning, you may think that there is an absolute, concrete, scientific, can't-ever-change, perfect answer. And there isn't. Even science now has become secure enough in who they are, because science is a baby. Science is really, really very new in the history of man. And my brother's a scientist. And he's very irritating because he wants everything to be black and white and permanent. And to him, the only thing that's happening as he does his science is to discover something that he didn't know. And he acts to me sometimes like he just overlooks the fact that sometimes the facts changed. And that's the great thing about science is as you learn new things, you have to adjust the way you think. And then you learn new things and you adjust the way you think. And this is an opportunity to be very healthy mentally as you learn to adjust to a changing world, as we learn more and more about it. And science now is saying, maybe there isn't any plan. Maybe the concrete realities that we have observed, if we get down to a finite enough level, we see that things don't always go this way or that. I remember, and I can't remember the term for it, getting too old, but I remember taking chemistry and finding out that cadmium wasn't always cadmium. In other words, here was the atomic weight for cadmium, and this is what it looked like, and this is how many protons and electrons had, but then once in a while it wasn't exactly like that. And so we had to take that into consideration. And chemists, as they delved into this, started discovering that some, what are they called? Somebody tell me. I can't. I want to say ion, but it's not an ion. It's a, it's another form of the same isotope. Isotope. Thank you. Another <coughs> isotope. I knew Steve would have it. He just doesn't want to talk because I've got a microphone on. But they start discovering all these different isotopes. And then, of course, that starts explaining the reason why some things act like they act. And they were looking for the answers of, if this is always the same, why do we get some slightly different reactions in here? Well, things aren't as nice as nicely ordered as everybody wanted them to be. And science started off with the idea that things would be nicely ordered. <clears throat> the world is not nicely ordered as we always wanted it to be. Good things don't always happen to good people, and bad things don't always happen to bad people. At least we don't see them happen. And the world can be very confusing until you learn to just take a breath and relax. Because you have to remember that perception is telling you what's going on. Sometimes people think that bad things are bad when they're really not bad. Last night on the television, I... Uh, watched a couple shows on the Pope. Pope is very sick. Pope is probably going to die pretty soon. And there's a great deal of sadness. Can't figure it out. Pope's old. Pope's had a long and rewarding career. He's been very brave about many things. You know, one of the things that was pointed out, and I was conscious of this, is he was the first Catholic to formally apologize for many of the many bad things that they did. Now, that's incredible bravery. And, but he has areas that he has not been willing to re-examine. But he gets to do that because he's a human being. On the show, they had an astronomer. Catholic father, been doing this astronomy work for 30 years. <clears throat> and he said out loud, I can't understand why the Catholic Church can't ever admit that it's been wrong. That we always have to pretend that we don't make any mistakes. Well, of course, last week, power, the notion of power 
came in. Buddhism has the same thing, and I think sometimes it's abused. When things go wrong, we play them down. And as long as we're doing that with a clear heart, that's all right because we play them down because we want to continue to have harmony. So we don't blow them out of proportion. But we have to constantly examine and look at what's going on. We have to look at ourselves. We don't necessarily have to look at institutions, and we don't necessarily have to look at our friends, because that's if we're doing that, we've set ourselves up to judge. We'll always have an opinion. The thing is, how old are your opinions, and when's the last time you actually looked at them and decided if they're any good? So this notion of reflection, which I really didn't start paying attention to until I moved to the desert, is this looking at things. Because I'm still walking around with baggage from when I was 18 years old, and I formed opinions about things. And I know that I didn't have any wisdom at 18 years old. I had a whole lot of things going on with me, but wisdom was not one of them. And yet I came up with these very strong opinions that I still drag around behind me. And sometimes I discard them, and sometimes I might even validate them because I look at them. And sometimes I start to speak, and I realize this opinion is so old that I have no idea why I have it. It's just baggage that I've been carrying around. So when the teacher says, why is the flag doing this? Or, you know, is it the wind? Is it the flag? What is it? What's going on? He's asking you to look at your opinions and your perceptions. And in the beginning, the teachers just asked questions. All the questions were different. The question depended upon the student because all students are different. And so the teacher just did his or her level best, you know, to shake the student up to get the student to look. And, of course, a lot of times it didn't work. Now, they don't usually tell those stories. They're not in the books because they don't uh, you know, have any pizzazz. The teacher said to the student, mm, and the student went the wrong answer, and the teacher didn't know what to do with it, so they both walked in opposite directions, shaking their head. Layman Pang one time went in to see the great master Matsu, and they had Dharma combat. And at the end of the Dharma combat, Layman Pang knew he lost. And this was a game they played. In other words, they each ask, they ask each other to keep re-examining reality on a daily basis. And Layman Pang, going down the road with his son, turned to him and said, Matsu got me that time. He got the best of that encounter. To even know that that's what's happening. When someone challenges you, sometimes when you read the stories of the great masters, it looks like they're angry. And they could have been, but hardly ever, because they know what they're doing. But sometimes they make loud noises and throw things at each other just to get attention. Do you make any loud noises with yourself? Do you ever examine what you believe? Or are you terribly comfortable? Have you settled in for the long haul? The Buddha examined what he believed up until his last day. And he repeatedly said to people, we are a collection of habits. We are conditioned. We need to realize this. To the Buddha, cause and effect was more than the idea of dying. It was more than uh, the cause and effect of karma that someone had led a good life so they'd have a good birth. The Buddha was very much like all the great Zen masters who said, your life and death takes place on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. My first teacher used to say that when you exhale, you die. And when you inhale, you're reborn. People used to come to him and ask about karma. He never gave a straight answer about karma. He never got into the Oh, yeah, you could be a cockroach, and then you could do all this. <laughs> he, th he thought that was totally a waste of time. <clears throat> because he felt people had to look at the moment to moment in their life. How many moments have you wasted? How many moments have you been here in the last moment? 
And so he would say to them, as you breathe in and you breathe out, that's the cycle of life. And you can renew, and you can start over. Not just on a daily basis, but on an hourly and a, and a basis by the minute, by the second. Because if you weren't paying attention, which around here is a big thing, paying attention, if you weren't paying attention and you realized you weren't paying attention to what you were doing and you started to pay attention, then something new is taking place. And now you're practicing Zen. And when you get distracted and you're trying to multitask, which is a word I really don't like, because, you know, over the last decade, people have talked about multitasking as if it's a great and wonderful thing. Instead of being able to only do one thing, you can do six things badly. Yeah, I think it's great. All you've got to do is call a business and get a hold of a secretary who's multitasking and the confusion that comes across the phone because they're trying to do more than one thing other than paying attention to you as you talk to them. So I'm not real in favor of multitasking. It sounds good. It sounds like the ambidextrous basketball player. It doesn't matter which hand he gets the ball with, he's doing really good. But he really is only bouncing the ball with one hand. It's not the same thing. It's divided attention. And we need to pay attention. And we can pay attention to ourselves when we pay attention to someone else. If someone's talking to you and you just pay attention to them, you're paying attention to yourself. Because it's very hard to form judgments when you're just paying attention to the other person. And it's very easy to form judgments when you stop listening. And when you stop listening, then the little mind in there starts forming all the things you're going to say as soon as they will be quiet so you can straighten them out. You know, because most of the time people just really don't understand what's going on and we're going to straighten them out. But it's very, very difficult when we're just quiet, when we're just silent, when we just listen as we listen in Zazen. Then something different is happening. There is no judgment. You might make a judgment when you stop listening. But if you're really listening, it's kind of hard to make a judgment. We do the same thing with ourselves. We attempt to do something. It doesn't work out. And we can waste an enormous amount of time kicking ourselves because we didn't do what we wanted to do quite right. I know that I'm certainly guilty of that. But if we just pay attention, if we just learn from whatever happened, then we're practicing the way. It takes a lot of effort to practice the way. It takes a lot of honesty to examine what we believe. And the only person that you have to be honest with is yourself. Yeah. You don't have to be honest with anybody else. You certainly don't have to be honest with me. But you have to be honest with yourself. When you find that you have a strong preference, once in a while it might be a good idea to check out why you do. Is that some old baggage that you're carrying around? Sometimes you find out that you like things that you didn't like because you're willing to re-examine it. Sometimes you'll get angry. Getting angry is a really good time for you to have a talk with yourself and understand why you got angry. Sometimes you get sad. That's a really good time to have a talk with yourself and see if you can understand why you're getting sad. Are you getting sad because that's appropriate for the occasion or are you getting sad because there's really a reason to get sad? Are you getting angry because you didn't get your way? Or are you getting angry because somebody is doing something harmful to somebody else? Are you getting angry just because you're frustrated? Frustration is the cause of a great deal of anger, as is any kind of pain. If you eliminate frustration and anger, or frustration and pain, there's not too much room left to get angry. So look at yourself. Examine yourself. Check out what's going on. If you're a really good person and you try really hard, you probably get to keep all of your beliefs. That's a little joke. <laughs> probably you don't. So that you find 
two very enlightened people in the great master Matsu and the layman Pang, who are recognized universally as being enlightened, being living Buddhas in their time, still going and having tea together on a regular basis to make sure that they don't fall into the trap of complacency, that they don't fall into the trap of just being comfortable with the way they see things. Because science has discovered that nothing is fixed, that things are always changing and there's new discoveries to make and there's new things to learn. And they're examining the same life that we live. The reasons you do things now may no longer exist. So look at what's going on. And while you're doing that, look at who you are. Because for the last two weeks we talked about ego. Is the flag moving or is the wind moving? The sixth patriarch exclaimed, no, the mind is moving. See if you can still that mind and understand the flag and the wind in yourself.